Our mission focus today, as we prepare to enter into our time of prayer, is uh, to remember Caleb and Christina Acosta. They are responsible for our Latino ministries here in the States, as well as, well, really around the world, but primarily it's in Central and South America. Uh, as we think about the, the ministries that we have in Venezuela, uh, and in Mexico, and other places, Nicaragua, and um, trying to think of them all, uh, Dominican Republic, um, anyway, Caleb and Christina oversee those ministries, and honestly, it's through them that those ministry doors have opened up to us uh, because of their heart for evangelism. It really grew out, just to give you a little more background here, it really grew out of uh, the fact that Caleb is originally from Venezuela, and he went down there, and on his vacation, he and uh, Christina started a congregation, and from that congregation, they made connections in Dominican Republic, and he preached revival meetings there, and a couple churches were formed there, and then here in the States, they organized a couple congregations in central Pennsylvania, in York, and over in Lancaster, and through those congregations, connections, do you see how this is all linked together? That's really how God works. Uh, and through the congregations here, the works opened up in Mexico and Nicaragua and other places. So uh, it's just how God moves by his spirit. And so we praise God for Caleb and Christina because it's kind of like in a book of Isaiah. They said, here we are, Lord, use us use us and God has used them and you're parts of their ministry because you pray for them and you support them. Our message today is to be found, well the passage we're going to read is to be found in Psalm number 104. This is one of the praise psalms uh, and it talks about God's majesty and all that he has done. I invite you to stand for a reading of portion of a portion of Psalm 104. I'm going to begin with verse 24 and read to the end of the psalm. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things, both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and the Leviathan which you form to frolic there. These all look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up, and when you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. But may sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. We conclude our reading of God's word. You may be seated. We have embarked upon a short journey into deeper questions and thoughts about basically the reality that we see around us. I called it my back to school theme uh, since that's what the fall has been about for many many years and even this fall though it's different uh, for teachers and students alike yet it's a back to school time and for us as believers uh, sometimes it's good for us to refresh some ideas and that's what we're talking about here uh, to kind of refresh them and to re-embed those thoughts and ideas into our mind so some of the questions we've talked about two weeks ago we talked about the idea of God himself is he for real well uh, that's a faith decision I believe that he is but you must make that decision for yourself we considered the cosmos as we looked around it and its great design and all the order that is there uh, last week. So is it just by accident that everything that is out there is out there? Or is there some kind of pattern or design? Well, again, it is a faith decision that each person must make. Is it just accidental or is it intentional? 
I'm on the side of the intentional. As I look at that hand that I see out there, the great designer, the great creator, the presence of God as he has been at work in creation, but there are many who have not accepted that and have not taken that particular step. But I would suggest to you that to take the step in the other direction is also a great step of faith. For in actuality, though there are many theories, there really is no proof in the end. And so it becomes a matter of faith whether I will accept the fact that it is just an accident or whether I will acknowledge the truth as I would see it, the truth that God is real and that he has made this universe. But today I want to take another concept or another major question, and that is the question of life itself. Obviously, you're alive, right? Now the question might be, are you awake? But, but, but you are alive. Awake or sleeping or awake, you are alive. Uh, a living being, you are here, you have moved. I want to talk about this idea of life. As we look at the reality that is around us, we can talk about the abstract, the reality of God. We can talk about actually the, the real, that is the, how the universe is put together in a very astronomic sense, the stars and the sky, or a very atomic sense, that is down to the small sum. We can talk about that uh, and how that points us. But... As we talk about it, we're talking about it from a point of view that we are aware, that we are alive, and that we can conceptualize that which is there. So there is another question that we have to ask, and that is the idea of life itself, and uh, what is the nature of life? Is it just simply by accident that it has come to be, or is it by intention? Is it uh, by design or not? So, did life on earth as we know it now, did it originate, or it is because of an evolutionary process, or was it an intentional process by the hand of God to make life as we see it today? Whoa, 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 I have to pause for a moment. How many of you remember last week's children's chat? Any timid hands out there? You remember, right? Charcoal briquette, little bit of water, and a salt shaker. Remember? The essence of life. You're just a bunch of charcoal briquettes filled up with water. Spanned it out with water. That's what I am. That's what we are, basically, with a little bit of salt, a little bit of other things thrown in, right? That's what we are. But that's the big weight, okay? Uh, if we're going to talk about life, we have to talk about the essence of life itself. And you remember in the children's chat what I did when I held up those ingredients in a bowl and I went, you remember that? We can talk about evolution if you want and we can talk about design and creation, which we are going to do today. But we also have to ask our question, the energy of life from whence does it come? Is that also an accident? Or is there something about life that has the mark of a creator God who creates life and breathes, as scripture says, into man that he becomes a living being? We'll talk about man next week, but I just want to not lose sight of that issue of life itself, the energy of life and what it is that makes something living. And we're going to talk about that here. As I think about life, and you want to define life, what is life? Does it come about by accident or by design? But let's first talk about it. Let's describe uh, diversity of life on our planet. What is life? Well, I have a series of eight things. Oh, I hate an eight-point message. We're not going to have an eight-point message, all right, but I'm going to throw them at you fast. What characterizes life and what separates it from that which is non-life? Consider these things, and we don't have time to stay on any of them, just briefly. Life is a matter of becoming. Becoming. That is, that it is growing into something, or growing as something. Life is a growing thing. It is a becoming thing. You think about a seed that appears to be dead, and you plant it, and what happens? 
It comes alive, if you will. It wakes up, if you want, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows. We come to church today, and we come through many cornfields. Well, we don't come through them, actually. We come between them, all right? So we're coming between the cornfields. But there they are. I can remember earlier on in the spring when those were just barren places, all right? Farmers planted their grain, and what happened? Voila, there we go. But guess what's going to happen to that corn? Already, some of it's already been chopped down, all right? Right? It's already been harvested. Life is this growing, becoming thing. It's reaching its out for its maturity. That's where it starts. But life has something. If I had a stone in this hand and I had a rabbit over here, the stone is not going anywhere, but that rabbit's going to want to get away. Living things move, okay? Living things move. They also metabolize. Rabbits eat grass and they turn it into more rabbit, right? They also do something else. But nevertheless, the grass is to make a bigger rabbit. From the little bunny, it grows on up. It's maturing. It's becoming something. It metabolizes food. And it will adapt and change. It will learn. This is a living thing. It can respond to situations. And living things reproduce themselves. Um, we're not going there, but how did you get to be here? Okay. You all have parents, right? That's how that happened, all right? The living things reproduce themselves. That's part of life. Stones don't reproduce themselves. That just does not happen. They reproduce, but when it comes down to it, life has a beginning and it has an end, does it not? It has a span of time in between, but it has a beginning and it has an end. And in that process between the beginning and the end, I like to think of as that we mature, okay? But let's be honest, we're just getting old. <laughs> I mean, that's right. Maturity is somebody's evaluation of whether the getting old was a good process or not so much. I mean, because we're all kind of immature in some areas, right? So maturity is on a scale, all right. But there's no changing the fact that I'm a day older today than I was yesterday. Okay, this is life, life, life on this planet. Life is defined by these various things and it separates it from the non-living things. Well, as we have studied life as human beings, we have grouped it into several kingdoms. And when I say several, there's actually six and some suggest seven. It depends whether you count viruses as truly living or not living. Have we heard enough about viruses lately, okay? Uh, so I'm not going to talk about them, but that is another unit of and it's a question of whether it's alive or not because it actually doesn't fit all the alive categories, okay, of what marks something that is living. But these other things do. You know what bacteria are? Are, you know what protozoas are, you know what plants are, you know what fungi are, you know what animals are, right? Okay. Science has just divided life up into all kinds of blocks of units that have parallel patterns and uh, functions and that sort of thing. So we can classify life on earth. We can describe life on earth. But there is something that we need to pause on for a moment on earth. As much as we, who are alive, want to find life out there, it has not yet happened. We must face the reality that life on planet Earth is the only place at this point that we know that it exists and has existed. There's hope that going to Mars, we might be able to find some kind of evidence that at one time or other life was there. Maybe, maybe not. We do not know. At this point, we only know that it is true here. Though we are looking, though we are sending wave patterns out into the far reaches of the universe, traveling at the speed of light, hoping that somehow there might be a connection. Though our ears are open to the cosmos, listening for some kind of radio signal from somewhere far, far away, we have yet received nothing. This is one of the great anomalies. Why is it? if they're there, that we have not heard from them or seen evidence of them out there. Well, I would add this to the thought in this area, and that is, there's no reason to think there isn't life out there. If God is a creator God, and he's the author of life, 
It doesn't really make any difference, does it? What will it prove if there is life found out there somewhere else? God is a creator God. He has his plans. He has his purposes unknown to us. So that's not really a problem, but it is just really our curiosity. Why do we seem to be alone in all of the universe? Why? Here is the bottom line. How special is life? How precious is a living thing? Think about that. We can think about it from a human perspective. I maintain that there is no human life not worth living under God's heaven, for every human life is a creation of God. That's why I don't favor abortion. That's why I believe in dignity for all human beings. No matter where they come from, no matter what the color of their skin or whatever. Because all are made in the image of God. All life is special. But I will take that over to another level too. And say that as I look at creation, I see life is special. In the forests around me, in the oceans on this planet, everywhere. You know, I've always maintained that believers ought to be the greatest ecologists in all the world. Because God has charged us to take care of it, did he not? It's right there in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1. To govern the earth, to take good care of it, God's entrusted it to us. But all life is special. So though we cannot know if there's life out there or not, we can know it is here. And we can know that it is something very, very special. And I also believe we can realize that it is not by accident that there is life on planet Earth. If you've ever studied the anthropic uh, situation of the Earth, do you know how unique planet Earth is in its uh, composition? Everything about it. Its size, the gravity, even the moon and what roles the moon plays in the transitions of the seasons and all of that and the movement around the sun, which is partly seasonal for us, and the axis of the earth and what that means for the heating and the cooling and really the magnetic fields and what that means for the upper atmosphere and what that puts in place is the protection from the killing rays of the sun. Have you ever looked into that? The earth is a really beautiful terrarium. It is really a very protected environment. This blue ball, if you've ever seen the pictures from space, that is flying around the sun and then flying in this galaxy of which we are a part and flying out across the universe. This small little speck of blue is a very special environment. Life is a very special element that we see on planet Earth. Let's talk a little bit about the essence of life. I'm moving towards the question of life, but let's talk about its essence for a moment. It is beyond actual classification and description. We try to do that. We try to organize it for our understanding, but do you realize as we think about life, you can think about your own physical body if you want. You are a living being. If you're asleep, you're not going to be thinking about this. You'll be dreaming about something else. But nevertheless, it's still happening, all of this. As we look at the common patterns that are around us in, on our earth, we see patterns in anatomy and in physiology. How many of you like chicken? Oh, yeah, I like chicken. I like eggs, too. But I like chicken. You know. How many of you like barbecue chicken? Now, I know you never think of this, right? But you, you got to realize I'm a little weird, okay? If you haven't already figured that out, I'm a little bit weird. But did you ever notice that the drumstick of a chicken is very much like your own leg? That there are two bones there, a major bone and a secondary bone. Have you ever noticed that the, the thigh of the chicken has that one longer bone that's there, which is the longest bone in your own body, right? And you know that the chicken has those hip bones, it's got its back bones, it's got its rib bones, it's got its shoulder bones, it's got its wing bones. Well, you don't have wings, but you know, it's the same sort of thing. The lower part is two bones, right? 
okay, and then out on the ends, all those little stuff that you don't eat, right? You just go on, yes, you know, you know the song, the ankle bones connect to the leg bone, leg bones connect to the hip bone, hip bones connect to the backbone. I mean, come on. You've seen this already. You know that in animalia, in the formation of physical animals who have walked around, that they're all very similar in their construction, in their skeletal backgrounds. They're, they're different. They've been adapted, okay, for different purposes, but they are really all this. The pattern is there, right? Well, Charles Darwin and others looked at those patterns and they thought, how did this come to be, okay? So the issue is, is that, well, over time, things have changed over a very long period of time so that if you can track back the tree of life, you'll come back to some kind of common ancestor that is there from which they all have come from, okay? It's not an illogical conclusion. From my point of view, I just happen to think it's wrong, okay? Because there is another conclusion that one can come to that's been around also for, well, actually for a very long time. The Origin of Species is 1859 is when it was published, all right. So it's only been around for 100 and what, some years, more like 160, 70, well, like that. But anyway, the other one is, is that there's a designer. God has built life on a common pattern. And on the building blocks of life, all life has come in that same pattern that God has created. And when you read in the book of Genesis, you'll see how he creates them according to their orders, according to their kind, as it said, not specifically. By the way, I have no problem with evolution in what I'll call the micro scale. It's the macro scale where the problem is. You know there are many different kinds of dogs, but they're all dogs, right? Okay, let's be more personal. There's many different kinds of people, but they're all people, right? Okay. Um, all right, if you read in the scripture, you'll see how God created them in their order and their kind. It doesn't mean that within those elements there have not been changes or developments and whatever. Like my brother-in-law, who was a biologist, said you can look in the fossil record and you can find horses of today and you can trace them back and you can find horses that look very much different from what the horses are today, but they're still horses. Even if it's millions of years ago, they're still horses going forward. Anyway, be that as it may, we look around, there are common patterns. How do we explain this common pattern? And it's not just in the uh, skeletal systems, it's in supporting systems like nerves and circulation and digestion and all that. And we talked earlier about the atomic level, that is last week, that even at the very basic level, the chemistry of life, okay, we can talk about a chicken. We can talk about you, me. We can talk about a chicken, but we can talk about a fish. We can talk about um, what other life form can we talk about? Even in any of the other kingdoms we can talk about, if we can get enough bacteria into a pile, they're only a one-celled organism, but if we could get them into a pile and we could just reduce them to their basic components, the chemistry would be the same as your chemistry, pretty much, pretty much carbon and water, the basic elements. The chemistry of life points to the fact that life does have its origin either in an evolutionary, by chance and happenstance, over long periods of time into what we see, or it has its origins in a designer who understands the chemistry and puts it together and creates it and makes it. The genetic code itself also supports all of this that we're talking about when we look at the essence of life. Life on earth has a very commonness no matter what you want to talk about in relationship to life. By the way, are any of you familiar with what's called CRISPR in, um, in genetics? CRISPR? It's a... Um, it's actually not quite, it's pronounced CRISPR, but there's no E. C-R-I-S-P-R. Um, there's a dash and some letters and numbers after that. But what that is, is it's something that was found in bacteria, and it basically allows geneticists, they can edit out certain uh, series of genes in a chromosome uh, chain. They, they can edit out something in the DNA, let's say there's a negative element, they can, it's called CRISPR, it, it can, like, it scissors it. That's the easiest way to describe it, it's much more technical, but they can cut that piece out 
Okay, so that if there is a, this is one, really one of the hopes of modern medical science, that someday we'll be able to solve some of these genetic problems that are part of humanity. Um, things like Hodgkin's disease or multiple sclerosis or genetically uh, transmitted things like hemophilia or whatever, that we can actually clip that part uh, in the embryo so that as that child develops, they'll not have that problem. Or we'll be able to create something that will be able to correct a previous problem that is developed, like cancer develops, and they'll be able to take a genetic code from you and they'll be able to clip, clip it and enhance your immune system so that then they can inject out of your own self your own immune system that will help then support your own immune system to fight off the cancer and there won't need to be a surgery to cure it. We're probably talking a century away, so you're born too soon. Um, but anyway, science is saying that someday that probably will be possible. It raises a whole lot of questions because not only can something like that be used for good, it could be used for designer human beings. You ever hear of the Clone Wars? Anybody a, a science fiction fan? Anyway, uh, well, anyway, as it may be where man becomes God, so to speak, and starts to create a superhuman race or whatever it might be that's done. Um, I'm sure you've seen no GMOs, right? <laughs> you opposed to GMOs? I don't know if you are or not, but I hate to tell you this, but you know, mankind has been GMOing stuff for centuries. We just haven't been doing it in the lab, okay? Uh, the corn I pass in the field out here looks nothing like the corn that was raised by the Aztecs in Mexico about uh, 2,000 years ago. If you ever saw that corn, it's, hard, it's more like a, a thing of wheat. It doesn't really, it, 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 corn's a grass. It just looks like a head of one of those grass heads that you might see growing, um, you know. But we have GMO in corn from, I mean, genetically modifying it by just selectively breeding it, okay, and creating corn as we have it today. So anyway, so if you do it in the lab, I guess it's not a good thing. Um, but, you know, if you can do it in the field, I guess it's okay. But I don't know. It's another argument. It's something to think about, if you will. But the idea is that the essence of life has within it great creative power. The creator has imbued that into life itself to respond to diseases and all kinds of things. It's all part of who you are, who, anyone, who we all are, and part of the creation. And then when we think about the essence of life, there is something else to talk about, at least at higher levels of life, although even at very lowest levels of life, I don't know, I don't suppose... It, I'm pretty biased, all right? I'm just going to admit that. I happen to think I'm better than a bacterium, okay, than a one-celled bacteria. But in a lot of ways, I'm not, okay? But it's been shown that bacteria that do not even have eyes can respond to light. Now, are they responding to the light or to the heat? Uh, it's a good question. But nevertheless, they are feeling something. They are sensing something, okay, that a one-celled organism. But you're a highly developed organism, aren't you? You like to think of yourself as that. I would like to think of myself as better than bacteria, right? Okay. Uh, anyway, think of the senses you have. Think of these things. Feeling, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting. How is that? How, how are... There's something called a brain that has those sensors out there in your nervous system that enables you to respond, to assess your environment, wherever you are finding yourself. And with the information, your brain is then able to process it. And be it visual, that is light bouncing on the ret hitting the retina, then you're able, your brain interprets it and you see. Same thing on your eardrums, the vibrations of the noise, whatever, then you hear. But your brain, your brain is a beautiful and wonderful organ. Sensory perception and intelligence are, an ins are a mark of life at whatever level you want to think of intelligence. Bacteria are not stupid. They know how to spoil milk. Anyway, um, they may not necessarily do it with intention, but it's just uh, their processes of life. When we think about the senses, it's how we understand, but the brain is how we reason. The information comes to us through our senses, but your reason helps you to work things out. 
You know what deductive and inductive reasoning are. Deductive is whenever you have a general rule so you can deduce specific points of view. Inductive is just the other way around. Lots of information that leads to a general rule. I'm not going to go there, but that's how your mind works, one way or another. You know something and so you deduce that it will work here. Or you learn from experience that you don't want to hit these nails, you want to hit the other nail, you know, the iron one with the hammer. Uh, so you go from specific mistakes to learning a general theory, I do not hit these nails with the hammer, okay? Nevertheless. But there's something more than your senses and your reason. There's something called instinct and intuition. Let me put it to you this way. There are some things that nobody ever taught you. There are some things that you never ever experienced. There are some things that you just know. I'll give you an example. How many of you have seen the monarch butterflies floating through the air? They are on their last season right now, okay? Do you know that the monarch butterflies you are seeing in Pennsylvania right now are the third generation? The first generation left Mexico and got roughly to Texas. They bred, and the second generation, it got somewhere up into the Carolinas, and they bred, and then the ones born in the Carolinas, or, or came out of the chrysalis, they flew here, okay? And they are laying their eggs, actually, actually they're past the egg stage, on our milkweed where we live. They're caterpillars now, probably about, oh, not quite three inches, about two and a half inches long. There's beautiful yellow and black and whatever you see them on the bottoms of the milkweed. Uh, anyway, they're going to go into their pupa stage, and then they're going to emerge, all right? And when they come out as butterflies, that will be the fourth generation. Guess what's going to happen to them? Winter's going to come, they're going to freeze, and they're going to die, and next year there'll be no monarch butterflies. <laughs> that is not what happens. Do you know what happens to them? They decide, we're going to fly south, like they decided. Like they reasoned it out, okay? In them is something. I can only call it that. Instinct, intuition, creative energy, they will fly south across the Carolinas or across Texas and they will go into the mountains of Mexico and they will come from all over North America, from all different places, okay, not just from here, but out west coast. They will come down and they will all congregate in the mountains of Mexico. You can go there and see them. They will cling to the trees and they will wait their turn to fly north into Texas for the generation of 21, uh, 2021 is what they will do. How does that monarch butterfly know to fly back to the same place where its great-grandfather and mother came from? How does it know that? There are some things you just know. It's also true of geese. I guess you know that too. I'm going to run out of time here. I can't give you too many illustrations. Geese, you know, lay their eggs in the far north and whatever. Okay, do you know what happens up there? They grow up and all that sort of thing. Get this time of year, the parents fly south and leave the kids there in the Arctic. Well, the kids don't know where they're going, right? Guess what happens? Once their breast muscles get strong enough, they will fly south in a V formation. They will fly south, and guess where they will go? To the same general, almost specific location where their parents came from. Intuition. There are some things you just know. I think in some ways we're too smart for ourselves. We should just know that God is real. We should just know that God has created this world with his particular design, including you, including me. And that God is indeed the author of life. But here is the postulation or the decision that must be made about the origin of life. Did it happen by natural selection and accident and evolution? Or has it been by design by God? You choose. Let me just remind you, if you choose that it happened by accident and not by design, that it's just happenstance, that it is the way it is, you are subject, get the Latin, lex salvos. It's called the law of survival. 
That's what you are subject to. You are under the law of survival. I talked about this before. The survival of the fittest means Hitler did nothing wrong. He just failed at what he tried. There's no moral value or anything to be placed in what he did at the time of World War II. Nothing. Just he tried something and didn't succeed. That's all. That's all. And so he didn't survive. He didn't succeed. That's where you're at. If you go with, it's all by accident, all by natural selection, by evolution and all of that. Nothing matters, only survival. That's what matters. But if you go with design, that is that there is a God, and there is a creator, and that all life is sacred because he has made it, that changes everything. Then that allows for a value system, a social consciousness, it allows for all those things, a sense of right and wrong. There are huge implications whenever we acknowledge that God is the creator of all. So why is there life on earth? Why do you exist? Do you have no reason and no purpose beyond survival? Is that it? Or is there a God who has made you in a very specially designed way, who loves you and has an eternal plan for you? If I had my choice between a mud pie and an apple pie, I think I'd know what I'd want to eat. How about you? Think about it. Think about it. The world is full of wonderful life, largely diverse. It is very systematic and it is all on a similar plan. I think that believing in a living God as a faith choice makes a lot of sense. Believing in a creator God who made life makes a lot of sense. And the other option, well, as I said, to me it seems like a mud pie over an apple pie. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for your wonderful creation and your gift of life and the gift of life that is ours through Jesus Christ. And as we pause for a moment to celebrate his life given for us, we pray that you will renew in our hearts our faith in you. That we will come with a sense of awe, a sense of wonder, but also a sense of love for you, our God, who has loved us through Christ. For in his name we pray. Amen. I invite you to take your elements for communion as we are going to share together in the bread and the cup. The scripture tells us that Jesus, in showing the completeness and fullness of his love, shared with his disciples on that night of the Passover meal these words. This bread, he said, is my body which is given for you. As often as you eat of it, remember me. In a similar way, he took the cup after supper. And he said, this cup represents my blood which is poured out for the remission of many persons sins. As often as you drink of it, he said, remember me. Oh Jesus, we give you thanks for the bread and the cup. For your body and your blood which you laid down freely for us. So that we might know life, that we might experience life to the full that we might find forgiveness and that we might find hope and purpose for the living of our days. We give you thanks that you are the great creator and that you have breathed into us the breath of life. Yes, the physical life for which we praise you, but much more the spiritual life, the life that walks with you day by day through time and into eternity. And we give you praise and thanks for your offering of your body and blood for us. And in your name we pray, O oh Jesus. And together we say, Amen. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you blameless before his throne, 
To the only wise God, our Savior, be honor, majesty, dominion, and power, and glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go in the peace of Christ and enjoy the week that he's given to you. See you next week, Lord willing, if not before.